Good evening and welcome to this uh, evening's presentation of the Continental Commandery Naval Order of the United States um, Naval History Virtual Lecture. Uh, before I introduce this evening's speaker, one, I just learned last week that the music that you just heard was composed by former Secretary of the uh, Navy, William Mittendorf, and it is called the Naval Order of the United States March. Um, our mission, as many of you already know, is to preserve, promote, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage. And so these lectures are Continental's contribution to that effort in order to help educate people about various aspects of our maritime heritage. The Continental Commandery was created in 2017 to meet the needs of companions who can't participate in uh, local commanderies, uh, those in New York, San Francisco, and, and many other locations. And so we only get a chance to visit through these virtual platforms. And I want to welcome everybody to, uh, to this platform this evening. Uh, one housekeeping item before I begin the introduction is that after uh, Dr. Thiessen completes his lecture, we will have a question and answer period. Um, I encourage you as he is speaking, questions come to your mind. You can uh, post those in the comments block while you're watching, and then I will draw the post presentation questions from that list of, of questions. Uh, and now it's uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the, Dr. William Thiessen. Dr. Thiessen is the Atlantic Area Historian for the U.S. Coast Guard. So welcome, Bill. Um, Thanks, sir. Uh, Dr. Thiessen earned a master's degree from East Carolina University's program in maritime history and uh, with a concentration in naval history. He then went on and earned his PhD at the University of Delaware's uh, Hagley program in the history of industrialization and technology, uh, again, specializing in maritime industries and technology. As I mentioned before, he serves as the Atlantic Area Historian for the United States Coast Guard. Uh, prior to working for the Coast Guard, he taught history at the undergraduate and graduate levels and served as curator and assistant director for five years at the Wisconsin Maritime Museum, which is the largest maritime museum on the Great Lakes. He's uh, written several books. I'll let him tell you about them. Um, but rather than taking up time now, uh, Bill, I want to again welcome you. And uh, my burning question is, um, what uh, inspired you to become the Coast Guard's Atlantic Area Historian? So I've been, uh, I've been actually, uh, participating in and researching and studying maritime history since the early 1990s. And uh, so this particular job was a really good fit for my background and for my skill sets. It's a, it's a, a very um, gratifying position. If, if you enjoy learning something new every day, you're, you wake up, uh, this is the type of job you want to have because the, uh, the story of the Coast Guard is forgotten in many respects. And so every time I do some research, it feels like I'm uncovering something new and something in many cases that's never been known before. And that I find for my background to be very rewarding. So it's been it's been a fun job. I've been in it for over 16 years now and uh, continue, I look forward to continuing in this position for a while still. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, without further ado, I turn the program over to you, and I'm going to uh, pull myself off the screen. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. This is a great pleasure to uh, to speak before the Naval Order, and I'm, um, it's very kind of you to invite me to, to talk about a uh, member of our service who is probably one of the most interesting, complex, and uh, controversial uh, officers in the history of the Coast Guard, perhaps, uh, and the sea services in general. Um, I'll let you make that decision. So with so many forgotten Coast Guard stories of heroism, bravery, and courage, the story of 
Michael Augustine Healy is unknown to most Americans and many service members within the Coast Guard, actually. Healy's career tied him to the taming of Alaska, America's last frontier, and made him likely the most interesting and controversial captain in Coast Guard history. In this particular slide, you'll see a selection of images of him as a commissioned officer. One to the lower left shows him in 1880. Um, the one on the right is farther along in his career. And then the one in, in the uh, back with the uh, group on board the uh, Coast Guard Revenue Cutter Bear one year before he left uh, command of that ship shows how his tenure in Alaska quickly aged him. <clears throat> but more about that later. Born in 1839 on a plantation near Macon, Georgia, Healy was the son of a white plantation owner and a slave. Had he remained in Georgia after uh, growing up, he would have likely been enslaved um, there in Georgia due to his uh, ethnicity as well as contemporary laws in Georgia at that time. To escape the situation, Healy's father sent Michael North. Healy's father was a devout Catholic with his siblings to be raised and educated in Massachusetts. The Healy children were sent to the Holy Cross Academy, later known as the College of Holy Cross, located in Worcester, Massachusetts. <clears throat> the entire family were devout Catholics, and Healy's siblings became ranking members of the Catholic Church hierarchy, including his brother James, who became the Bishop of Portland, Maine, his brother Patrick, who became the president of Georgetown University, Sister Eliza Healy, who became Mother Superior, overseeing a number of Catholic convents and schools. Despite his ethnic background, Healy appeared Caucasian, as did his siblings, and he never admitted his racial background to others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unlike his siblings, Healy's calling was the sea. In 1855, he completed his education at Holy Cross and signed on to a merchant ship at the age of 15. Over the next 10 years, he came up through the hawse pipe with the enlisted ranks on commercial vessels to become a merchant ship officer before applying for an officer's commission in the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service, predecessor to the Coast Guard. During this period and later in his career, he developed a penchant for drinking and the nickname Hell Roar and Mike Healy due to his boisterous behavior in the bars. He did not relish, nor did he encourage this nickname, even though it stuck with him for the rest of his career in, uh, in the revenue cutter service. Here you can see him seated on board uh, one of the vessels and a merchant ship similar to the ones that he sailed on in his career, merchant career. In March 1865, just a month before his assassination, President Abraham Lincoln signed Healy's commission. As such, Healy became the nation's first commissioned officer of African-American heritage. He was also the first of his kind to command a U.S. vessel, first to achieve every commissioned officer rank from third lieutenant to senior captain, a rank at, at the time, the late 1800s equivalent to today's flag rank and first of his kind to sail virtually everywhere in North and South American waters, including the Bering Sea and the Arctic. <clears throat> Two years after receiving his commission, Healy served as navigation officer for the 110-foot cutter Reliance on her voyage from the East Coast around Cape Horn to San Francisco. The trip began in August 1867 and included eight brutal days of gale force winds and mountainous seas as the topsail schooner slugged her way around the horn. This trip cemented a long friendship between Healy and veteran revenue cutter captain John Henricks, who served as Reliance's commanding officer. A few months after Reliance's arrival in San Francisco, the Treasury Department ordered her to the newly acquired territory of Alaska, which had been acquired in 1867. In October 1868, 
Henricks and Healy sailed the Reliance to Sitka, Alaska. She was one of the first federal vessels to serve in the waters of Alaska territory and the first one to enforce U.S. laws there. You can see a painting here of uh, John Henricks in his uh, heroic Samson pose. Uh, he was actually the founder of the uh, Coast Guard Academy in the late 1800s. From Alliance, Healy and Hendricks transferred to the West Coast Cutter Wyanda, and four months later they transferred to the steam sailing cutter Lincoln, named for the president that commissioned Healy. Healy returned with Hendricks to the East Coast after their tour on board the Lincoln ended. You can see images here of the various cutters that these two men sailed aboard when they were helping to uh, establish revenue cutter service in Alaska Territory. During these shared cutter assignments, Healy learned a great deal from Hendricks, probably the service's most experienced officer at that time. In 1874, Hendricks received orders to ferry the new cutter Rush around Cape Horn to San Francisco and selected Lieutenant Healy as his executive officer. After the delivery, Hendricks and Healy returned to the East Coast. However, in 1880, Healy traveled back to the West Coast where he served the rest of his career. Alaska's vast maritime and coastal frontier required the support of the service's law enforcement, humanitarian, and search and rescue capabilities. During the late 1800s, American maritime interests had chased valuable resources such as seals and whales into icebound waters. The uh, reason for this is that the whale populations uh, in the rest of the Pacific were diminishing due to overfishing. In addition, as U.S. shipping began to operate into the winter months, the duties of the Revenue Cutter Service increased in frozen areas previously considered unnavigable in wintertime. Thus, Revenue Cutters patrolled Alaskan waters as well as the Bering Sea. And you can see, see two images here. One is to the upper left, the uh, Cutter Corwin, and uh, see just how thick the ice once was uh, back in the 1800s, and ironically, how ill-prepared revenue cutters were to survive in these dangerous and threatening icebound waters. And then in the lower left, cor uh, lower right corner, you can see an image that was engraved prior to si the Civil War, showing just how plentiful whales could be in uh, Alaskan waters uh, back in the pre-Civil War days. During the 1880 Bering Sea Patrol, Revenue Cutter Corwin undertook a search for the missing Arctic exploration vessel USS Jeanette, which had been sent north and under Navy control to try to find the North Pole. Um, and in the process, uh, she actually sailed very close to what is today Wrangell Island in the uh, far north in the Arctic. This was the service's first Arctic rescue expedition. On this cruise, Healy served as executive officer under famed revenue cutter Captain Calvin Hooper. The 1880 cruise established the annual Bering Sea Patrol as a primary mission of West Coast revenue cutters. However, uh, during this particular expedition, no trace was found of the missing ship. It was later learned that the Jeanette had been crushed in the ice with the loss of 21 of her crew members. You can see a depiction of what her final hours look like um, in the lower left corner here. 1882, Healy assumed command of the Venerable Corwin. In the fall, an event occurred that haunted him the rest of his career. The U.S. Navy command in Alaska believed the Native Alaskans located in the village of Angoon to be in a state of rebellion and ordered Healy on board the Corwin to shell the village, devastating the settlement and killing and wounding villagers. In the eyes of Native Alaskans, this event tarnished Healy's career and remains a controversial issue to this day. Um, up in the right-hand corner, you can see the Corwin uh, published, this engraving was published in one of the government uh, reports on her expeditions to the Arctic, showing just how thick the ice was uh, back in those days. 
By the Angoon Instant, Healy grew to become a larger than life character. In 1883, he was promoted to captain and later described his command philosophy. When I am in charge of a vessel, I always command. Nobody commands but me. I take all the responsibility, all the risks, all the hardships that my office would call upon me to take. I do not steer by any man's compass but my own. He wrote two Bering Sea Patrol cruise reports based on his cruises in the Corwin uh, that were published by the government printing office that became popular books uh, for uh, just the general public. And in 1894, the New York Sun claimed Healy was, quote, a good deal more distinguished than any president of the United States or any potentate of Europe. He became so uh, famous with American readers. You can see a image of Healy here, one of the last years he was on board the uh, Cutter Bear, uh, with one of the more unique mascots, a parrot. Um, not too many birds were used as mascots in the day. April 1886, Healy took command of Revenue Cutter Bear after she sailed from the East Coast around Cape Horn and arrived at her new home port of San Francisco. It was like a second marriage for Healy. The bear uh, had been made famous by the Greeley Rescue Expedition, of which uh, she was one of the rescue vessels that took part uh, up sailing near Ellesmere Island, well above the Arctic Circle, to save the five or six remaining uh, members of that expedition, which had been stranded uh, up in the Arctic for two years without any, uh, any provisions or any other supplies being brought to them. Owing to Healy's reputation as successful missions, he commanded Bear on the annual Bering Sea Patrol the next 10 years after 1886. During the warmer spring and summer months, each one of the patrols covered at least 20,000 miles of cruising the islands and shoreline of the Bering Sea. Conditions on the Bering Sea Patrol were harsh, dangerous, and stressful, and at times deadly a fact demonstrated by a bear crew members left behind at Dutch Harbor, Alaska's Lonely Cemetery. In his, late in his career, Healy described the hardships of this thankless but important job. To stand for 40 hours on the bridge of the bear, wet, cold, and hungry, hemmed in by impenetrable masses of fog, tortured by uncertainty, and the good ship plunging and contending with ice seas in an unknown ocean. Many have heard of the sheriffs and marshals of the Old West, men such as Wyatt Earp upheld the law in places like Tombstone, Arizona. While law enforcement officials of the Old West laid down the law in a town or a stretch of land, Captain Healy laid down the law for the territory of Alaska and the Bering Sea, an expanse of water and land roughly the same size as the lower 48 states. Moreover, while sheriffs in the Old West use a horse and gun for law enforcement, Healy used an armed vessel, which cruised the waters of the Eastern Pacific, North Pacific, and Arctic and Siberian waters. Few know of Alaska's dangerous maritime frontier of the late 1800s, a place far worse than the failed, fabled Wild West. There Healy made his name contending not only with misfits and criminals, but deadly sub-zero temperatures and ship sinking ice using a wooden vessel far less capable than today's icebreakers. In addition to the ice, there were heavy seas, and high winds, as well as rocks and reefs, ready to disembowel a wooden ship. He described the conditions in his log. Quote, this is a miserable country to cruise about in, miserably surveyed, full of hidden rocks and reefs, not down on the charts. When Alaska became a U.S. territory, one of the revenue cutter's primary duties was protecting endangered fur seals from poachers. This duty was the genesis of the Coast Guard's modern living marine resource of protection mission. Under Captain Healy, Bear patrolled the waters of the Pribilof Islands, enforcing seal hunting and regulations and seizing poachers. Healy later stated, quote, those operators would gladly cut your throat and sink your ship with all hands aboard for the sake of furs. 
furs are gold in Alaska. Seal hunting patrols proved the cutter's law enforcement value, and in 1908, the Revenue Cutter Service took responsibility for enforcing all Alaskan game laws. You can see here some images uh, from that mission. On the left is the Revenue Cutter Bear uh, visiting Valdez, Alaska with um, Japanese seal poachers that had been uh, taken off the Pribilof Islands and um, taken in for um, trial in Valdez. On the right is a very unique chart that's held by NOAA's antique chart collection that actually shows the track lines of the Bears Patrol around the Pribilof, Pribilof Islands, signed by uh, Mike Healy and his navigation officer, and it shows just how tedious this patrol work could be, sailing back and forth between the, uh, the two islands there to uh, patrol against uh, seal poachers. So it's an interesting history, but that duty could be uh, boring and punctuated by sheer terror at the same time. Under Healy, one of Bear's most known, best known missions was saving lives at sea, but Bear also preserved the lives of those struggling to survive on land. Native Alaskans have been whalers and fishermen for generations. However, as foreign whaling and fishing vessels depleted Alaskan waters, these food sources declined, causing malnutrition, starvate, and starvation among Native Alaskans. To help them, Healy tried to convince authorities that Siberian reindeer could be brought to Alaska, stating, quote, the introduction of deer seems to be the solution of three vital questions of existence in this country, food, clothing, and transportation. By 1890, Healy hatched a plan to get reindeer to Alaska. In 1891, to test the reindeer's ability to travel by sea, Healy shipped si from Siberia to the Aleutian Island 16 live deer and hundreds of bags of native moss for feed. The experiment proved a success, and Healy's views won over government officials in Alaska and Washington, D.C. In 1892, he brought over the first shipment of reindeer to Alaska's Seward Peninsula and established a receiving station at Port Clarence. Over the course of the 1890s, cutters transported thousands of reindeer to Alaska. By 1930, Alaska's domesticated deer herds totaled 600,000 head, with 13,000 native Alaskans relying on them for basic nutrition. And you can see in uh, these photographs here, very rare photographs, overexposed images of reindeer being pulled aboard the uh, bear one at a time using a sling and a, and a hoist. And um, the, even though it proved a success, the uh, reindeer were not accustomed to being transported by sea. Many of them got seasick, a few of them died, but the uh, the majority of them did survive the trip and uh, proved successful enough to, to turn it into a, a regular annual event, uh, bringing reindeer across from Siberia to Port Clarence. Under Healy's command, Bear's humanitarian efforts not only included the care of Native Alaskan communities and rescue of seafaring people, the Cutter controlled illegal liquor distribution that was used to exploit the native peoples. Aboriginal people referred to bear as Omiak Puk Pachartanaka, which I'm sure I mispronounced really badly, meaning the fire canoe with no whiskey. Bear's humanitarian support of Alaska was assistance on a large scale, but the cutter also helped individuals on the maritime frontier. As one revenue cutter service historian wrote, in assisting private persons, neither class, race, nor creed made any difference to the bear. Degree of stress was the stroll, sole controlling factor. For generations, no roads or railroads existed in Alaska. So cutters were the only federal presence in the territory. Under Healy, bear became not just a multi-mission vessel like many Coast Guard cutters today, but also an interagency asset providing support for all federal agencies in Alaska. For example, on Healy's 1891 cruise, the bear sec secured witnesses for a murder trial, buried reindeer from Siberia to Alaska, 
said Alaska's governor on a tour of coastal islands, shipped to U.S. Geological Survey team to Mount St. Elias, carried lumber and supplies for school construction in remote locations and above the Arctic Circle, delivered school teachers to their assignments, carried mail for the U.S. Postal Service, enforced seal hunting laws in the Pribilof Islands, supported a U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey team, provided medical relief to Native populations, served life-saving and rescue missions, and enforced all federal laws in the territory. And you can see here some of the uh, work that they did with the U.S. Coast and Ge Geodetic Survey, um, trying to uh, chart magnetic um, anomalies in the uh, Arctic. <clears throat> During his career in the Revenue Cutter Service, Healy's ethnicity remained a secret. His racial background was likely unknown not only to his peers, but also some of his immediate family. No evidence exists that anyone besides his wife and siblings ever knew Healy's African-American heritage. There is a, a journal that was kept by Frederick, who's pictured here to the lower right when he was on board uh, the bear and visiting various islands and the journals. And he wrote in his journal that he believed himself to be the first uh, white boy to visit any of those islands, indicating that he likely didn't know what his father's ethnic background was. By the mid 1890s, Healy had served 10 years on the Bering Sea Patrol. Ironically, while one of Bear's missions was to interdict smuggling of illegal liquor to Native Alaskans, the stress caused by 10 years on the job encouraged Healy's own drinking problem. In 1896, the service relieved Healy of command, dropped him to the bottom of the captain's list, placed him for four years on awaiting orders, which is the same as unpaid leave. In addition to the Angoon incident and his drinking, his demotion proved another stain on his reputation. The service later reinstated Healy. He served on a number of cutters before retiring in 1903 as the third most senior officer in the service. In 1904, physically spent, Michael Healy died at the age of 65 and was laid to rest at Holy Cross Catholic Cemetery near San Francisco. Only a stone's throw from his land-based pier, Sheriff Wyatt Earp's final resting place. Overall, his ocean-going career had spanned 50 grueling years. 70 years after his death, researchers determined Healy's true racial background. And in conducting that research, they actually approached the family to um, gain access to Healy's personal journals, which still existed at that time. Um, there was an interest in trying to produce a feature film based on Healy's long life and career. And after learning about what the researchers found and their interest in producing a film about him, the family burned his journals. So we'll never know what exactly he had written down in those, in those diaries, unfortunately. Michael Healy made a lasting impression on American history as the first man of African American heritage to receive a US Sea Service Commission and first to command a federal vessel. As a powerful law enforcement officer and a lawless maritime frontier, he helped shape the history of Alaska. During Healy's time in the territory, he explored, policed, protected, nurtured, defended, and helped preserve the humans and animals that survived in that forbidding land. Today, Captain Michael Healy is the namesake for the Coast Guard's medium icebreaker, Healy, He's arguably the most colorful, complex, and controversial officer in the history of the United States Coast Guard. If you take a look, you can see once again just how his service in the uh, Bering Sea Patrol had aged him so quickly uh, over time. Also, I'd like to point out that the uh, icebreaker Healy, which is pictured to the lower right, uh, just um, made an expedition to the North Pole and became the second U.S. ship to make the uh, transit to the North Pole um, on individual basis. So the uh, 
namesake of Michael Healy is, is making history as well. Anyway, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about Michael Healy. He's a special historical person in the uh, history of the Coast Guard, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Bill, I want to thank you for a fascinating um, uh, presentation about somebody I had never heard of till I read your uh, synopsis of this evening's presentation. And, um, you know, as you're talking about going up into the ice pack in the 1880s, 1890s, I'm thinking and my background is tainted somewhat with a PhD in chemical oceanography and marine microbiology. And how much we didn't know, how much we still don't know, but how much we didn't know about pressures that ships would, uh, ships holes would encounter as they entered the ice pack. Um, how was that, you know, the first ships like the Corwin, how were they prepared to, to deal with what they were going to encounter? Was it just on a wing and a prayer? That's a really good question. I, when I do uh, research the history of icebreaking, which the Coast Guard's one of their missions is icebreaking in the uh, polar areas, uh, Antarctic as well as Arctic, there's a, a distinction that most historians and people don't make, which I think is unfortunate because the ships that sailed in the Bering Sea in the Arctic in the uh, late 1800s, I consider to be ice surviving ships. <laughs> many, many call them icebreakers, which is really a misnomer yeah. because their hulls were made of wood. They were indeed reinforced to try to withstand the pressures of being in the pack ice. Um, many of them, such as a bear, I would compare to old iron sides because their hulls were about a foot thick of wood okay. and their frames were not, were pretty much side by side. Uh, to withstand that uh, those pressures. They had special equipment to help them survive, such as um, one of the big problems with trying to survive in the ice if you have a steam vessel is trying to do so without your propeller being bent up by the ice. And so the bear was actually designed with a retractable propeller. So when it was trying to sit out some time in the uh, pack ice, they could retract the propeller and wouldn't get bent. Also had a, a metal sheathing on the bow to help it find its way through fissures and leads in the ice. But there's no way you can say that the bear was an icebreaker. Um, perhaps it could have broken a few inches of ice, but beyond that, it was mainly designed to survive in the ice. The Corwin was designed in a similar fashion as well. And uh, the bear had a remarkable career of 77 years because of its, its great design and served not only to um, rescue the Greeley Expedition 1884, but served all the way up into World War II with the, the uh, Coast Guard's Greenland Patrol. So even though um, it was made of wood, it was such a thick hull that it survived for decades where other wooden ships would would have been decommissioned early in their careers due to the, the uh, duty that they served. Was uh, making a, a rounder bottom hull that would tend to be pushed up by the ice uh, part of that design strategy, or is that something that came about as we turned into the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century? Yeah, that's that's part of the, uh, the design is to uh, make possible these vessels kind of floating up on the ice. Not, not all the way, but uh, sufficiently so that they would not be crushed longitudinally by ice pressures. Um, so that was a part of it. The bear was built in Scotland, and I have to really tip my hat to the shipbuilders in, in Scotland because they really knew what they were doing when they built the, uh, the bear. And another cutter of ours, Athetis, which also participated in the Greeley expedition, was similarly designed and built in Scotland as well. And uh, both of them uh, were a, a real tribute to their, their builders and designers. Fascinating. Um, a related question, what kind of armament were these ships equipped with? You know, you, they, they did a lot of law enforcement activity, both against uh, illegal fishing, and uh, it sounds like 
some activities ashore. And so most cutters today aren't all that heavily armed, especially the icebreakers. Um, what do these guys have? So a big part of the law enforcement uh, mission of the Revenue Cutter Service was carried out by their crew with um, sidearms, uh, long guns, and uh, cutlasses. And the ones that sailed up to Alaska did have cannon on board, but they weren't heavily armed. For example, when the Corwin shelled Angoon, I believe they only used one gun. Hmm. Uh, and the, the Cutter Bear was not much different. It carried um, one deck gun forward. Um, that was up armed, depending on what the uh, political status was at the time, they might be up armed uh, to carry a second deck gun. But um, the Arctic and Alaska and the Bering Sea were not really considered um, a place requiring um, a large amount of heavy armament. And of course, the Revenue Cutter Service was there to enforce the law. And if need be, naval vessels could be sent up to, uh, to take care of anything that was combat related or required greater armament. For example, there was a a big fishing dispute in 1892 between the British, Canadians, um, Americans, and some other foreign fishing countries internationally. And uh, the British sent up some of their warships and the Americans sent up some of their warships as well. So in that case, it really didn't require the Revenue Cutter Service to have heavy armament because the Navy was taking that mission on in the Alaskan waters. The whole issue was settled. Um, later on, you know, uh, diplomatically, but uh, demonstrated that the, the Coast Guard was really up there to enforce laws, not necessarily to um, serve as a, uh, a platform for heavy weaponry. So it kind of informs the uh, the next question that was posted. Can you discuss the chain of command above Captain Healy, including how the U.S. Navy played a part in directing his missions? So uh, at, at times in Alaska, going back to the Angoon um, incident, the Navy did have overall control of the territory, but there were times when it did not and it had civilian control. So uh, when he was ordered by uh, Naval officials to shell the village, uh, he was under their direct command and supervision. He was um, subordinate to their command. So he actually was carrying out the orders of the Navy when he did what he did. Uh, unfortunately, he was stigmatized with that in spite of that um, command, chain of command. The, uh, oh, revenue, cutter, I'm sorry. the revenue Cutter Service tends to go underneath, tended to serve under the Navy in times of war. So that was the case in World War I and uh, also the Spanish-American War. So a lot of the revenue cutters, including Bear, were um, serving as naval vessels with Coast Guard crews or revenue cutter crews during those those uh, conflicts. I understood. And so um, how large was the revenue service in the post Civil War period? Um, probably I would, it, it varied, but from Civil War through the um, uh, early 1900s, it really didn't um, have more than 10,000 officers and men uh, all together. Uh, and how many ships team. were uh, typically assigned to, I'll call them ice strewn waters, because as you say, they certainly weren't cutters, but I'm sure we had, uh, was it only the one ship on the West Coast and one other on the East Coast? Actually, um, the, uh, the warmer months were the only time that uh, cutters were sent up to the Bering Sea. There's only one instance when it, uh, one was sent up in wintertime for obvious reasons. So there were actually several cutters that would rotate that duty as Bering Sea Patrol uh, um, cutters. That included the Bear, Corwin, depending on which one was in commission, the Rush, the Thetis. And most of these vessels were um, given reinforced bows so that they could survive in case there was ice. But as I said, most of them served up in Alaskan waters from probably May at best 
until September or October when the uh, ice started close back in down the Ar from the Arctic. So you mentioned that uh, during these months, the cutter would make frequent ports of call along the peninsula. How well populated are, are many of those islands along the Alaskan uh, peninsula? So the uh, bear generally would make port calls for duties and assignments that it was given or missions it was given. So for example, if it was responsible for setting up a school and taking teachers to a particular village, then it would go to that, that particular uh, port. Um, sometimes the cutters were brought in for extreme law enforcement needs. And that would include, for example, Nome, Alaska, when it had its gold rush, um, and the Yukon when there were um, miners and settlers going to those locations, oftentimes not being anywhere near prepared for the conditions they would face. And so as a result, uh, the cutters such as Bear would be there to enforce laws in pretty wild frontier towns, but also to take away settlers and miners that were sick, injured, or really had no business being up in a wild frontier area, especially in the wintertime. Fascinating. Um, you mentioned the federal interagency quality of some of Healy's missions. Uh, how, is there any indication how that interagency coordination affected his career for better or for worse? Um, well, he worked hand in hand with a lot of various officials from government bureaucracies, such as the Department of Education, um, the Bureau of Native American Affairs, and um, the, uh, the Territorial Government of Alaska. Many of these uh, representatives actually sailed on board the bear to carry out these missions. Uh, school teachers, there was really a large group of varied officials that would actually be on board the uh, bear at any given time. And it was designed to have spare space on board for either carrying these different officials to their assignments or to carry off settlers and, and people that need to be shipped back to uh, Seattle um, because they were unfit to be in Alaska territory. So um, it was, it was a very, um, mixed bag and it was a, I'm sure an interesting group of people to be assigned to uh, to carry to their various assignments and uh, and the different interagency missions that uh, bear carried through and we have a couple of comments coming in from uh, Robert Hansen that his uh, grandfather had served aboard the uh, bear and uh, he spent most of uh, World War II in the Aleutians um, apparently as a Arctic water expert. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see. Um, looking at my list of questions. Uh, so, any is there any understanding of how um, uh, Captain Healy felt about Holy Cross as he went through his <coughs> revenue service career? He, I'm sure, was was overjoyed to be graduating from the academy. He was actually being sent over to France for further education by his older brothers um, at a uh, Catholic seminary, I think. And that's when he decided to sign on with uh, the merchant service instead. <laughs> so he had no interest in uh, furthering his education uh, whatsoever and decided instead to further his education on board merchant ships. Came up through a house pipe. He was 15 years old when he started sailing on merchant ships, and uh, as a, in those days, the uh, rate rating would have been a boy, quote unquote boy was what they were called. Well, wow. and he made it all the way up to uh, first mate on board merchant ships before he became an officer in the uh, revenue cutter service. But you can see from his writings, some of the quotes that I read off in this program, that he was a very intelligent man. And, uh, and also, I need to stress that uh, in spite of his reputation with the Angoon incident, he did all he could in his, in his power 
to uh, help uh, Native Alaskans in terms of fighting starvation, malnutrition, and uh, bringing to them health care and uh, other support that uh, his ship could provide them. So, it, like I said, he's a very uh, interesting and complex man. He was a smart person, but he had certain interests. And um, he was very supportive of the Native Alaskans in spite of his, uh, his, bad, his reputation. Okay, so uh, uh, Robert Hansen is uh, saying that uh, he, his grandfather served aboard the uh, bear probably right around the time uh, Captain Healy was retiring from the cutter service, but he had already been gone from the bear, what, almost uh, 15 years by then? That's correct. Yeah, he finished up in 1895 with the bear. He'd been on board for 10 years. But the bear continued to sail until the 1920s, and it was turned into a museum ship, and then later served uh, in Richard uh, Admiral Byrd's Antarctic expeditions, and then uh, later was uh, returned to U.S. service as uh, part of the Greenland Patrol as the USS Bear. So given the, the speed of travel of the typical uh, 1890s, um, multi-powered ships, uh, i.e. sail and, and coal. Uh, was there a reason that the Coast Guard or the Revenue Service waited so long to create a, a major presence in, in Puget Sound? Well, the uh, it, it originally much started closer out closer to Alaska. Pardon me. It being much closer to La Alaska, that probably. Uh, almost a week closer by sail or even by, you know, eight knot steaming. Right. I think part of it may have had to do with the settlement of ports on the West Coast. San Francisco naturally was the predominant port city on the West Coast for decades. And I'm not sure that there was enough settlement or support for uh, a revenue cutter base on Puget Sound until later, much later than San Francisco. But the Cutters did eventually uh, become home ported there. I think Port Townsend was a, uh, a port for the Revenue Cutters. Right. And then uh, later Seattle became the uh, one of the home ports as well. However, the Revenue Cutters continued to sail out of San Francisco as well as Seattle, even when Seattle became a port for the Revenue Cutters as well. So, uh, Nowadays, of course, the icebreakers that we have are home port in Seattle and not in San Francisco. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. I think we've covered. Ah, does the Coast Guard socialize the history of Captain Healy's service? That's an interesting turn of phrase. Socialize. Um, well, he's definitely an important figure in uh, for historians. This particular program that I'm presenting right now is going to be published as a story in Naval History Magazine in one of their upcoming issues. So we try to get the story out as much as possible, uh, particularly because he brings up so many um, different issues uh, associated with serving in the 1800s from race to Alaska history and working in the Arctic as well as the Bering Sea Patrol. There's so many ways to plug into the Healy story. And so I've done my best to uh, promote it. I'm not sure if if you or any of your listeners are aware that uh, the bear was found recently in the waters off of Massachusetts. It had uh, sunk there in the 1960s under tow and had been on in the... Uh, Water is about 200 miles offshore for many years, about 300 feet of water. If you go to NOAA's website, you can see the history of the search for the bear, as well as the uh, discovery of it last year. It's a pretty historic uh, shipwreck. And to be 200 miles out, it seems like she's probably right on the edge of the continental shelf. I've yeah. had the pleasure of spending a lot of time at sea on the North Atlantic continental shelf, both driving mine sweeps and doing uh, oceanographic research. And uh, once you yep. get to the edge of the shelf, it gets deep very quickly, but 200 miles out, 
you're in fairly shallow water as open ocean waters go, which means, of course, they they pile right up. Yeah, we were afraid that uh, knowing the coordinates where she left the surface of the water, that she might have sunk in some deep ocean trench. But we were lucky and, and gratified to learn that she was actually closer to the fishing banks there. Brown's Bank, I think, was the area that she's located in on the seafloor. Okay, so again, um, people are uh, suggest to take a look at the book, The Track of the Bear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and Robert, if you're interested, uh, share some photos and we'll put them up on the uh, Commandery's LinkedIn page to, sh to share with the rest of our companions. So uh, I invite you to do that after the lecture. I think we have covered all of the questions. Let me just oops, take that down and see if there are any others that came up in the private chat. I think we've covered all the questions. And so uh, I'll take this opportunity again. Thank you. Oh, I was going to ask one more. You know, in the Navy, we have our Farragut. We have our Sims. We have that guy from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, oh, yes, Jones. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, Commodore Preble, that we really make sure that our up and coming, uh, particularly officers, but also our enlisted, know the history of our premier leaders, uh, at least through the time of the Second World War. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll take this chance to uh, remind everybody we're going to be back on the 17th of November, uh, where uh, Trent Hone will be talking about his new book, Mastering the Art of Command, Admiral Nit Chester W. Nimitz, and the Victory in the Pacific uh, War. We certainly learned a lot about uh, Admirals Nimitz and King and Spruins and Halsey. Um, is there a comparable education program about this, the Coast Guard stalwarts over history? And I know it, it may be more mundane for you folks, because almost every day there's heroic rescues being performed throughout the ranks and it might be more difficult for you know, ship's commanders to, to get the kind of recognition that the rare Navy commanders get it gets. I would say the closest that we have to uh, um, a senior officer that's received a fair amount of recognition was Admiral Weishi of World War II fame. He was rated by Truman as one of the top 10 flag officers of World War II. And um, his story is, is pretty well known, but I have to go back to say that, um, you know, that our service is a relatively forgotten service and many of our heroes and very important people are are not recognized um, as highly as, as many of the other military agencies are. Uh, we have our combat heroes. We have many heroes from our other statutory missions, such as search and rescue and humanitarian response. But um, any of those names have been lost to history. It's, it's my job to try to bring those back and uh, make sure the general public and even our own service knows who they are. And we have our website, which is pretty encyclopedic. If anybody's interested in the history of the Coast Guard, it's if you just go to uh, Coast Guard Historian's Office website, it has all of the uh, different flag officers that have served and chronological events and important response efforts. And then also you can go to the, the blog series that I um, am in charge of called The Long Blue Line. And that comes out every Friday on the My Coast Guard social media sites, our big, biggest site of the Coast Guard. But that profiles virtually every aspect of history. There's 350 essays so far, it includes events, response efforts, some of our great leaders, some of the heroic rescue efforts we've done. There's a couple of pieces about Healy and the bear on, in there as well. So I'd recommend people try to search those out. Those are actually archived on the historian's website as well. So there's a lot of history out there. It's primarily online, I'm afraid. Well, then uh, we'll uh, look for it and uh, I will share it through email blast to our companions. Uh, also, I'll take this uh, opportunity to, uh, without locking you into a particular date, um, 
welcoming you back on future dates so that you can help get that word out about, you know, some of the notables in uh, Revenue Cutter Service, U.S. Coast Guard history um, so that we can help more of our citizens uh, and not only Naval Order members, but others who visit our site to have access to, to lectures about the, um, the greats of the U.S. Coast Guard. And with that, I will I'll thank you and uh, I'll thank, thank everybody who participated this evening and we will end the broadcast. Thanks, sir. I really appreciate it. Take care.